Hey everyone, it's Dr. Tofai. Thank you for joining me. Today is Tuesday. We're here for another Hernia Talk Live. Some of you are joining me via Zoom, others on Facebook as a Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai. Thanks to everyone who follows me on Instagram and Twitter at Hernia Doc. And many of you also sent me questions via herniatalk.com, which is the precursor to our Hernia Talk Live pre QA. Um, you all know me as Sharin Tofai. I am your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. I'm very excited today because a surgeon that I completely admire so much will be joining us. His name is Dr. Guy Paymont. He's French Canadian. Uh, originally, he is one of the premier surgeons in orthopedic surgery at Cedar Sinai Medical Center, which if you have seen any of the reviews on US News and will report, no, it's one of the top centers for orthopedic surgery, both in my town, Los Angeles, but also in the entire United States nation. And he leads the educational training for them. He's a trauma surgeon, sports surgeon. You can follow him on Instagram at Mall or on Twitter at GDariusP. So he's of course busy with patients. So he'll be joining us shortly. Uh, I'm really excited to have him because the goal of today is to try and understand the orthopedic side of groin pain. So we've discussed this multiple times before. The groin is can can let me rephrase this. The groin is a very complicated space. You can have a lot of different problems that cause groin pain. It can be intestinal. We've had gastroenterologists come and talk to us about diverticulitis and appendicitis and Crohn's disease. It can be gynecologic. We've had gynecolog gynecologists join us and talk about endometriosis, ovarian cysts, fibroids, um, adenomyosis, and other reasons for groin pain. And uh, often it's just referred to as chronic pelvic pain in women. We know obviously hernias can cause it. It's actually the most common cause for groin pain. Um, we shall be having some spine surgeons coming, uh, so they can talk to us about how the spine can actually cause groin pain and how spine surgery can cause hernias. So that's going to be really exciting coming up in the near future. And then today we will be focusing, focusing on orthopedic surgery as a different cause of hernia pain. So what is orthopedic surgery? It's basically surgery of the bones. And in the pelvis, there's the pelvic bone and there's also the, the hip. So the combination of the, the sacrum, the pelvis, and the hip uh, is what, what is part of the pelvis. And then groin pain can be referred pain from any of those areas where there may be disorder. It could be arthritis, a fracture, uh, a tear, um, inflammation in the area and so on. So that's what we're going to be discussing with Dr. Paymal. I have a lot of questions. So many of you may know that I've written a book. It's called The Sage's Manual of Groin Pain. I've written it with two other of my esteemed hernia specialist colleagues, Dr. David Chen and Dr. Bruce Ramshaw. It is, I believe, the premier book on groin pain. And there is an intense chapter on just orthopedic causes of groin pain. And that's important because it's a, it's a very unique and important part. Dr. Paymon, who's our guest today, was the author of that chapter. It is intense. He did such an amazing job of going through all the different diseases that can cause groin pain that are orthopedic. And he has pictures of how to examine and, and all the different manipulations that doctors can do to help differentiate groin pain from other pain. So yes, we we're hoping to review all that with him. Um, he is a, a uh, surgeon that I often refer to, not because necessarily some of the stuff I refer to him is his specialty, because he's mostly like he does a lot of hip surgery and hip replacements, but he's just a super intelligent surgeon. You know, I feel that a lot of my success has to do with the success of having other specialists that I can rely on that like me are inquisitive and won't kind of shy away from problems or complex patients and really know their 
their kind of specialty well. Uh, and so I do have a great like black book full of <laughs> patients that, um, I'm sorry, surgeons and doctors that I rely on, whether many of them are here on Hernia Talk and I bring them on. Many of them, I share patients from across the United States. And you've seen many of them from the East Coast and the South and North and Midwest uh, that have come on my show. So it's really fantastic for me and for my patients to have access to these doctors so they can all kind of figure out some of these disorders with me. So we're hoping that once he's uh, able to finish up patient care that he'll join us for this. In the meantime, a lot of you have sent questions. It ranges from hip problems to spine problems to pregnancy related and labor related, orthopedic issues, sports hernias. Um, I'm really excited to review these with Dr. Paymal. And I'll tell you, when I see a patient with a groin pain, I have a very open mind. In fact, some of them actually have hernias. And I say, yeah, you have a hernia, but it's not your problem. In fact, I sent him a patient, I think last week. So the patient had groin pain and a very clear hernia, but the pain was, ref the, he takes like a C, like a, like makes his hand into a C and he puts it along his hip on the side and says, this is where my pain is. And that classically is a hip problem. Usually people who have groin pain due to a hernia have pain also like encompassing their, like focusing around the hernia itself. They may have testicular pain, but they often are better when they're lying flat. Not true for hip disorders. This guy, he's not better when he's lying flat. They, off, they can have um, pain with certain activities that involve uh, uh, differential flexion at the hip. Stairs and hills can be a problem. And that's not usually the situation for groin hernias. And then very importantly, when they're lying flat, their pain does not go away and they have buttock pain, which is what this gentleman had. And you ask them, do you have a hip click? In people that have labral tears or an impingement, they can have what's called a hip click. And in having that hip click, it, what it does is it actually um, uh, is pathognomonic for a hip disorder. Now, not everyone that has a hip click has painful hip, but if you have a painful hip and you have a hip click, then those two diagnoses go well together. So those are like little clues. So when I talk to a patient, I really don't want to fix their hernia if that's not going to help them. So I send them to Dr. Paymal, for example, and we've also met Dr. Snibby, who was a actual hip specialist in town that uh, I heavily, heavily uh, rely on. In fact, I'm wearing his shoes. <laughs> I think I showed you guys. Uh, Snibs is like a S-N-I-B-B-S. You can find it online. They have he makes comfortable shoes that are good for your hip and knees and, and um, pelvis and back. And uh, I own a couple pairs and my mom lives by them. So I'm actually wearing <laughs> Snip shoes and you can watch my interview with Dr. Snibby. Uh, I think it's been a year because we've, on, on, we've been online doing this for about a year and a half. So um, that's the thing with the hip. So if they have a hip click, uh, pain that radiates to the buttock, pain with hills or stairs, pain that's not better uh, when you're laying flat, and difficulties with either crossing your legs or being frog-legged, uh, those are all more consistent with a hip problem. The other thing we'll also, I also am curious to talk about with Dr. Paymal is sports hernias. So sports hernias can be repaired uh, surgically at times. And that is a very tricky procedure because it's often on athletes and you don't want to mess up their career by doing an unnecessary or poorly healing operation. And so you really want to go to a specialist for those. Um, we talked to a specialist in that uh, early this year with Dr. Poor, and we're planning on having a future discussion with some other really like world famous sports hernia uh, surgeons, both nationally and internationally. We also spoke with Dr. Ali Sheen in the past from Manchester in the UK. So the way the orthopedic surgeons approach sports hernias are very different than the way hernia doctors do. So uh, I really want to hear how Dr. Paymon does it because that's really uh, clear. 
So if you guys want to send in your questions, I'd be happy to review them. I have a ton of questions for Dr. Paymol, um, which I will very gladly like share with him the minute that he is done with his patient care and comes on over. I also am curious what other specialists you'd like to hear from. We have some really amazing foregut surgeons for hiatal hernias. It's not something that I do, but it's definitely in the world of hernias, diaphragmatic hernias. They're all coming up. I've got a great um, session coming up on a hernia mesh and all the different meshes, what's been recalled, what hasn't, and, and what's pros and cons for different meshes. And I recently had someone write to me asking to talk about insurance, which is a very um, US central type topic. I have a lot of people that come on and watch me internationally. So it may not be as relevant to talk about insurance to my international audience, but definitely um, something that can be done in the future. So if you think that's a good topic, then we'll do that. Let me share a screen and kind of go through some of the questions that have been shared with you uh, by you. So one was, I don't have a tear and I don't have a hernia. What other orthopedic problems can cause my groin pain? And when I see a patient like this, uh, mostly it's things that go into my mind are um, sacroiliitis, which is either an infection or inflammation of your sacroiliac joint or what we call the SI joint. And uh, that can be either an autoimmune problem or a mechanical problem. Uh, there's imaging for that. And you can also get injected to the SI joint. You can also have uh, an autoimmune antibody that's elevated. HLA B27 is a blood test that can be checked as that problem. Um, hip bursitis, hip, anything of the hip joint can cause groin pain. So hip bursitis, hip labral tear, um, hip arthritis and hip um, um, uh, impingement. So like a cam type impingement. There's also psoas impingement, which is partially related to the whole uh, hip bursitis kind of element. Um, and of course you have a fracture. That would be uh, odd not to know if you fractured your pelvis. Tumors theoretically of the pelvis can cause groin pain. And then there's a whole pubic symphysis issue. Let's see, we got a question here in the chat. Can groin pain cause pains around the top of the legs and hips? Yes. So it's very important to see where in the groin the pain is and how much of the hip and upper thigh is involved. So if it's a hernia problem, then hernia pain can radiate to the inner thigh and sometimes, but especially femoral hernia is to the upper thigh, but often not the lateral or outer thigh. Spine problems can cause pain in the lateral outer thigh and kind of the lower, uh, lower front of your thigh. And then some people that had bad hip problems, they feel like there's a, like there's like a tightness around their entire hip area, sorry, their entire uh, upper thigh area, like someone put a band around their thigh. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. Dr. Paymol hopefully will help answer that. But uh, definitely the, the area and the location of the thigh pain can be diagnostic of uh, different types of hip problems versus hernia problems. Pain in the groin is in the center small joint. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you can help me figure out what you mean by that. Uh, next question, what type of pain exists with trochanteric bursitis? Great question. Um, so based on my experience, bursitis is, there are different ranges of it. It can be very mild or very severe. Uh, the amount of pain in the bursa, which is the sac, which carries the, like the fluid space in the joint, um, the amount of inflammation there can be very, very painful. And typically it affects your gait, uh, so how you walk, whereas hernias should not cause you limping or any gait problems. Also sitting or crossing your legs can hurt. Also the pain can be at the groin, but also at your upper buttock area, immediately behind the groin. So that's more diagnostic with bursitis. Um, you can even have that kind of C-like 
pain where it's like a pain if you put your hand on your waist and that's uh, where the pain is. Um, so that could be from bursitis. X-rays and imaging are very diagnostic of bursitis. So it's a fairly straightforward diagnosis with imaging. And then secondly, they tend to inject you. So there's often no surgery for bursitis, at least for the early stages. All right, let's go to the next question because we got so many questions to go through. Dr. Paymon is still with uh, patients. So I'm hoping that the minute he's done, um, he can walk on over and uh, help me answer these questions. Okay, let's, there's another live question. Let's see. My left hip rotates forward constantly due to a denervated abdominal wall and resulting poor posture. Yes, I've seen that. My entire core aches and PT, we've been working on this, but still struggling after almost two years. Any recommendations? Yeah, you know, once your core is unstable, then that has a big difference. It's like scoliosis. It's if your, once your spine is out of whack, then it can have a lot of other implications to things, even like your heart and your lungs. So uh, yes, when your core is, is unstable, that's a problem. A uh, surgery to help stabilize the core can sometimes realign the hip. I'm actually doing one. I think she wants a surgery in January. So um, a lady who does have denervation injury of the abdominal wall, and she actually, her, her husband's like, her posture is different. And it's true. Her, she kind of holds herself in a little bit of crooked way. And the pelvis is kind of shifted, almost rotated. Um, and long-term that's not healthy. So we're fixing her. Next question. What are the most sport associated injuries that can cause groin pain? Well, the most obvious one is the one that, uh, we're struggling with in Los Angeles, which is doc, which is LeBron James <laughs> of the Lakers. One of the most talented, the greatest of all time, LeBron James, and he has a debilitating sports associated injury. He's a man that's of large build, has humongous muscles of the rectus muscle and the adductors and his bone is just like everyone else's bones. And so when he um, trains and, and plays professionally in basketball and our lovely Los Angeles Lakers that hopefully will win a game tonight uh, against Golden State, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, he's constantly, those muscles are pulling off, uh, like tearing the bone apart. And he's been dealing with this for over a year. And it actually, yeah, for sure over a year. And it's been completely debilitating and can't play. It's just, uh, and the more you try and push through it, the worse it is. It's kind of like a Chinese finger um, trick where the more you pull on it, it actually gets tighter. So the more he plays, the more he's injuring himself. And you really can't, uh, like rest is really, really important, but then, you know, how long can you rest uh, when you're the, the head leader player? So yeah, that's a problem. And there's a question here about osteitis pubis. So itis means inflammation. So osteitis pubis is inflammation of the pubis bone. And that inflammation can be from something that LeBron James has, which is the pulling of the adductor muscle or the rectus muscle off of the bone and causing inflammation there. It can also be um, due to the um, infection, though that's uncommon, but it is a known cause of osteitis pubis. And so in the center, that is not hernia pain and that is not hip pain but as osteitis pain, it can be due to like a sports hernia. Um, we see that also in football players, again, large build males, a lot of really heavy muscles, thick, strong muscles that are pulling themselves off their insertion on the bone during practice or professional football games. And so we see it in football player, American football players, uh, soccer players, or European football players, um, rugby, a lot of hockey and, um, some basketball. So these are typically very strong people with really big muscles. They do a lot of this kind of hip adduction, which means like a lot of, uh, like the splits type, uh, actions and running and jump, uh, jumping and so on. 
and, and landing. And so what they see is you get the kind of the muscle pull off and it's very, very, very painful. All right, next question. Have you heard of groin pain after IVF? So that's a really interesting question. IVF means in vitro fertilization. The whole process involves a lot of hormonal changes and hormonal kind of injections. And so patients can get groin pain after IVF for two reasons. One is, of course, these are women. So one is they can actually have exacerbation of their endometriosis. So they can have endometriosis in the groin region or the round ligament or um, in the pelvis. And the endometriosis is triggered by the in vitro fertilization because of the high hormonal uh, injections and transfusions, infusions. And so that's one way where groin pain is worse during IVF. The second is in general, hormonal surges, especially estrogen surges can increase your pain level. So all pain may be increased during IVF, potentially. Same way they could, that pain can get increased with uh, someone during their menses. So if you have a small groin hernia, you may actually have more pain from the small groin hernia during your period, during your menses, or during in vitro fertilization. It's purely a hormonal thing. And then the question is about um, whether orthopedic causes can be worse during IVF. And that is really related to, um, I think, hormonal changes in the laxity of the, um, of the ligaments. And so I'd love to hear what Dr. Paymon's answer would be to that. Next question is uh, about traumatic separation of the pubic symphysis. Have you seen it during labor and what's recommended for such injury? So if you're a petite woman and you're carrying a baby, it's very possible that your body will undergo certain changes that are just <laughs> horribly traumatic. For example, if you're a small body and the baby's large and or your small body and your pelvis is narrow, more a male type pelvis than the more kind of wide female pelvis, then all the hormones that go into your system that encourage your abdominal wall muscles to expand also encourage your ligaments to be very lax. And in being lax, it some people actually dislocate their, their um, joints. Uh, you can have discs that occur because of some of that laxity. And then also your pubic bone can start separating from each other. That's not even during labor. That's during the act of uh, being pregnant, as the baby is growing, your, your pelvis also kind of disrupts and opens up at the ligaments. Then there's a question of traumatic separation of the pubic symphysis during labor. And that is really, I mean, it sounds to me that that occurs at the time of when the child is brought out of the vaginal canal. And you can actually scrape that whole underlining area of the um, uh, behind the pubic bone with instruments with the baby's shoulder, uh, etc, uh, and cause a lot of injuries. And I've seen people who do that, who, who have suffered from that. It's just a horrible complication because there's so much damage, then you get scar tissue from that. And that's kind of this bad um, cycle. Next question. This is a live question. I have a bladder mesh injury. The obturator internus was severely injured due to the sling being implanted in it. Um, the rest of this didn't come through, but basically the question is regarding the obturator internus muscle being injured with the sling in, being implanted. As far as I know, there's no surgery for that. It would have to be a combination of, of um, physical therapy and maybe even in, injections, but the question is, what recommendations are there for the obturator internus muscle? Yeah, so depending on how the bladder mesh or the pelvic mesh was placed, it may be go through the internus, through the obturator um, canal, and then also through the muscles with the different hooks. And because of that, uh, the act of removing it may actually cause damage in that area. So it's good to kind of see 
what can be done um, from an orthopedic standpoint. Uh, so we're, we're hopefully when Dr. Paymal is back from his patient care, we can get him on, on board and have him answer some of our questions here. Next is the question about pain from femoral hernia. It definitely increases during menses. Okay, so someone here is sharing their experience about how the femoral hernia pain severely increases with menses. Uh, she writes, when I had a hysterectomy for groin pain uh, that I didn't need, that increased my pain my pain uh, away, but the hernia pain was still there. Yes. So uh, correct. The hysterectomy is almost never a treatment for groin pain. Uh, and I know that people are sometimes labeled as having fibroids or adomyosis. Um, but if the pain, if the worsening pain with menses goes away because you don't have like menses anymore because you don't have a uterus, that doesn't necessarily treat the problem, which is the actual hernia, which is the cause of the pain, which I think is what our viewer is trying to answer. Thank you for this platform. Oh, well, thank you for always being my top fan. Um, I really like that everyone joins me. I'm, I'm to this day still impressed. <laughs> impressed that people join me to talk about hernias. I mean, I enjoy it, but I'm really impressed that you guys enjoy it because most people don't go around like showing interest in hernias unless they have one. Maybe you all have one and that's the, that's the impetus. I don't know. But I'm, I'm very grateful that you join me for an hour each week. Uh, I do do this um, in a way that I feel is hopefully helpful to you guys. Oh, we have a chat. Let's see what the chat says. Um, you make them interesting. Oh, that's very nice of you. Uh, yeah, definitely did not think hernias were interesting when I was in training. I'll tell you that. But uh, I, my residents... Let me, let me stop this a little bit. My residents actually find it interesting, which I love. When I was a resident, hernias, not interesting. It was the most boring, straightforward, like no interest, no, no interesting stories, no interesting surgeries. It was just like no one went into hernia surgery at all until I was much, uh, until I finished my training. And then I started figuring out that, wow, there's a lot of hernia surgery that needs to be done. And I, I got to liking of uh, Dr. Parvi's Amid, and he's just an amazing uh, surgeon. He was the only one that made hernias interesting. So I started to kind of emulate him and try and be like him. And now all my residents think hernias are interesting. They seem to want to scrub in on all my operations because they have a choice, you know, they have like gastric bypass, they have a stomach cancer, a colon cancer, a bowel obstruction, and a hernia, and they tend to choose the hernia surgery. So I don't know if I'm interesting or the hernia is interesting or the story is interesting or what the situation is, um, but I love that my residents enjoy hernias and almost every year or so I, I have someone among them that is very much interested in, in doing this as a career. So you got some really great surgeons coming up in the hernia world. Okay, next question. Oh, comment by you. You're a blessing to those of us in need of help. You're welcome. I do appreciate it. Next question. I've had the sling totally removed. Several nerve injuries running to the groin, inner thigh, vaginal pain, but the groin and pubic pain is significant. I've had multiple blocks to the pelvis and general femoral nerve and injections to the optic. I don't know if there was anything else I could, there was anything else I could do. Well, okay, so here's the thing. You clearly had an issue that required uh, some type of management um, because you're having complications from the pelvic mesh. The problem is the following. Just because you had pelvic mesh complication does not mean that that complication hasn't caused other injuries or that you don't have something that was missed. Orthopedic injuries could be one, an actual groin hernia could be another. It's just so common to have hernias. 
it should be always considered as a part of the work workup of a groin uh, groin pain. So, in terms of man pain management, I would start with an MRI pelvis to really understand where there's inflammation, where there's a hernia. Is there retained foreign body that needs to be addressed? Is there scar tissue in the area? You can even consider MR neurography to see if there's a neuroma that's involved and then have someone carefully go through your physical examination and your story. Um, so that's kind of uh, where we're at. And I'm very pleased to say that on that note, I believe Dr. Paymal is ready to join us. And I know that you will love him as much as I love him because he is truly one of my favorite people. And I may be too embarrassed to say it to him live. <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, you'll see, you'll see, he's just such a thoughtful and, um, caring and educated, uh, surgeon. So any minute now we're going to have him, uh, log on and let's see how he does. We have all these questions for him and we only have half an hour. I may have to bring him back. What do you guys think? <laughs> All right. Senor Paymol. I should practice my French with them. I'm always too embarrassed with the French people because I can speak French, but their accent's so much better than mine. <laughs> All right. Here's another comment. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I think we will bring him back again because he's just a wealth of knowledge and that's his uh, payback for, for spending time with patients instead of with us. <laughs> All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll back to his introduction and hopefully we can get there with him. So some of the questions we're gonna review are the, the labor pains, um, the uh, obturator internus injury and the um, hip rotation with core, core instability. Let's see where he is. All right, you know what? I will be continuing on with our session until he comes on because there's a lot of questions. So one interesting question is regarding like the interaction between hernias and orthopedic problems, like actual, like separately. I have some patients that have a hernia and they have an orthopedic problem. So uh, one question they asked me is, can a large hernia cause orthopedic problems? Usually not. They're two separate problems. So orthopedic issues usually do not cause hernias and or hernias do not usually cause orthopedic problems. There he is. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry, the clinic <laughs> was heavy. I'm going to have to come and break up your clinic. Everyone wants to bring you back. So <laughs> you just committed yourself to another session in the future. Uh, no problem. This time uh, I will cancel the afternoon, the whole afternoon. <laughs> so. <laughs> so welcome. This is Guy Paymal. You don't, you didn't hear me, but I just raved about you and oh, thank you. Uh, you're such a blessing to my patients. And sometimes I don't even know if you're mad at me for sending me sending no. many of my complicated patients, but yeah. I trust your judgment. So that's why. So, so we answer questions or you ask yes. me questions or. Yes, we have okay. a lot of live questions. I'm hoping to get through some of those and we have tons of um, questions that were presented before. So I will uh, kind of go some of, through some of those, but um, one question here, I'll show you. Just okay. I'll share a screen with you here. So one question, which uh, I'd love to know your thoughts on, has to do with um, traumatic separation of the pubic symphysis during labor. Have you seen that? I've seen that many times, actually. Uh, when I was at UCSF, uh, it's a large uh, OBGYN department. 
almost as large as Cedars. You're talking about five, 6,000 deliveries per year. Yeah, I think Cedars And 9, we would see that quite often. In most cases, the, uh, you know, the separation will correct itself and the, um, the synthesis will, will go back to its original position. Oh, really? The, yeah, the cases with, that I've seen that required surgery were usually women who had two or three uh, pregnancies very close to each other. And between each pregnancies, the, the symphysis pubis would not have time to close back. And oh, wow. I remember the first person that I had to do surgery, um, she was the wife of an internist at UCSF and she had four babies like in six years. And she was a, a grammar school teacher and she had so much pain that she couldn't work. I mean, she, she couldn't even take care of these poor kids. Yes. So, um, I went and you know base, put double plates you know across the symphysis pubis, and she did fine. But it's extremely rare. I must have done maybe, I think eleven or twelve in thirty years. So, so if the, if it happens, this is traumatic. This is at the time of labor, or this is because of pregnancy and the lack of actually, um, as you know, in the third uh, trimester, there is a hormone called relaxin. Yeah. That starts being released. And it affects the symphysis pubis, but also the sacroiliac joint in the back. They become more flexible. Right. And of course, if you're carrying twins or triplets, the, the symphysis opens even more. And if it's a big baby, if it's a difficult delivery, it can open more. But generally speaking, of all the cases that I've seen, I would say we, less than 1% would require you know, surgery to mm. put the synthesis back in place. And is there certain types of binding or physical therapy that they no, do? The, the, but no, the, the physical, it's time essentially. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, really interesting. But, but I would say, especially if it's a relatively young woman, let's say under age 40, usually the synthesis will, will close back. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Next question has to do with uh, the obturator internus. Yep. So this lady had a bladder mesh injury. The obturator internus was severely injured due to the sling being implanted in it. Are there any recommendations for the obturator internus injury? Absolutely. I've had, yeah. She said, I've had the sling totally removed. There's several nerve injuries running down the groin and inner thigh, vaginal pain, groin and pubic pain is very significant. I've had multiple blocks to the pelvis, general femoral nerve, obturator nerve, um, kind of at a loss, but uh, my recommendation was an MRI pelvis to look for inflammation, uh, injury, any disruption or actually a hernia that may be missed. And mm -hmm. sometimes you can have neuromas from these bad injuries. But I don't know what she, exactly what she is referring to, but um, if she's referring to the, uh, obturator internus muscle, you're absolutely right. I think an MRI will determine, you know, if that muscle is inflamed yeah. or the, the other short external rotators, you know, in the, in the neighborhood because they, they, they originate, you know, from inside of the pelvis, very close to where they would have put that mesh. Yeah. Uh, you're right. I think it, the best thing to do is to have a, a good quality pelvic MRI, like a three Tesla, yeah. Um, and basically tell the radiologist that uh, exactly what she's looking for. Because as you know, with pelvic MRI, they have different sequences, either soft yeah. tissues or musculoskeletal. She needs a soft tissue sequence. Yes, absolutely. Okay, next question had to do with rotation of the pelvis as it relates to the core. So I have a patient that I'm operating on who had denervation of her abdominal wall wow. um, from spine surgery and actually not spine surgery. She had a nephrectomy. They did a T12 injury. So she has denervation of her abdominal wall. And this has become like a growing mass on one side, like a little baby. And her, her hip, her like pelvis is rotating 
as a result of it. And there's another lady that's on this. And so far we've had a lot of female questions, but I do have male questions too. Um, uh, similar situation. She also has denervation of her abdominal wall from multiple kind of hernia repairs that have gone wrong. Sounds like she says, my left hip rotates forward constantly due to denervated abdominal wall and results in poor posture. My entire core aches. In PT, we've been working on this, but still struggling for almost two years. Do you have any recommendations? I presume this is a asymmetrical denervation of abdominal wall. I mean, one, yeah. one side is normal, the other side is uh, denervated. Am I correct about That's that? That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, really deep. This is a big problem. Yeah. And, but that um, makes sense, right? If your core is imbalanced. So yeah. for that, I, I actually do, uh, I kind of try and return them to a more normal abdominal wall. It doesn't re re add function, but there's more stability. So I placate the abdominal wall with a very wide onlay mesh. And that seems to help these patients that are clearly denervated. It Anything definitely else? helps. The, the, the problem is that you... Because of the uh, denervation, you lose the dynamic stabilization mm -hmm. uh, of the core muscle on that side. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there is a magical solution for that. Yeah, that's a tough problem. So here's some more questions that have been submitted. This was an interesting one. Have you ever heard of groin pain after IVF in vitro yeah. fertilization? Yes. Okay, tell me, because I gave them my theory, but what is your theory? I mean, or what is your reasoning for groin pain after IVF? Um, the case that I've seen, um, the, the patient had multiple attempts at IVF, and it was the, the last attempt. The, the procedure took a long time, and it was positional you know, at the time of the procedure. I don't know what your your theory is, but um, I think that's something that the uh, OBGYN uh, should be aware of that. And IVF, it's not a minor procedure. Oh, so you're saying at the time of egg retrieval? Yes. The way that and, they do they well, it goes they go transvaginal. Yeah, but they, they had put the patient in too much abduction. Oh, her, her and, legs were, and, and it took a long time, you know, it was mm -hmm. usually it's, it's a fast thing, but it took a long time. And that lady had uh, a couple of uh, quote unquote harvesting procedure it had not yes. worked. And that was really in that case, a positional problem. And eventually she got better and then the pain went away. So we know that when women undergo certain gynecologic operations, the longer ones, uh, if they're often put in lithotomy, so the yeah. legs are in stirrups, and if that's a, done incorrectly where there's too much abduction, so too much um, hip flexion and external rotation, and it's not like the hips aren't aligned, then you're like, are you impinging? at the Did joint you, or what happened usually you end up with a adductor sprains mm. you know that you see uh, people you know slipping on ice you can see that an uh, ice skater hockey player yeah. and it takes really a long time to heal okay do they get also these muscles are used all the time when we walk in daily life yeah and these patients will complain that they say growing pain, but it's a little bit more toward the midline, you know, mm. it's more, if I, if you allow me to say that it's more crutch pain than growing yeah. pain. And then what about uh, labral tears? Can't they get labral tears from that positioning or no? No, okay. no. Okay. Okay. There's another question um, regarding sports associated injuries what are the most commonly seen um, sports associated injuries that can cause groin pain? It, it's definitely the labral tear. Yeah. They, um, 
there's a surprisingly large percentage of the population that have a, a CAM deformity. And the, the most common explanation, the most accepted explanation for the, the origin of a CAM deformity is that when you're a teenager, uh, you're 12, 13, 14, during your growth spur, you do a lot of sports. And because you're growing so fast, the growth plate becomes really thick, but also weak. And you have a little slip. It's not the, the classic slip capital femoral epiphysis where the, the femoral head completely um, slips from the neck, but just a little slip. Yeah. So that the head goes backward and, and a little bit, you know, sideward and then the growth ends and usually it's people who are very very active and they end up with a cam deformity and these people they are very active when they are teenager in their 20s and their 30s and then they get a labral tear and can you explain what a labral tear is okay the hip joint it's a ball and socket joint so the the socket is a hemisphere the ball, it's a sphere. They are together a little bit like a ball bearing joint. Yeah. And the labrum is essentially a rubber gasket around mm -hmm. the joint. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, for people who are mechanically inclined, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, you've seen, you know, rubber gasket that, you know, they break or they tear. The, the joint becomes a little bit loose, if you want, yeah, and painful. The I would say 10, 15 years ago, in teenager, people in their 20s, people would do, do an arthroscopy, remove the labrum. These days, if all is possible, you repair the labrum, like you, like you would repair a meniscus in a, let's say, a 22-year-old person. Yeah. And in some cases, you can even reconstruct the labrum with a, uh, a semi-tendinosis or a gracilis tendon. Wow. Okay. Uh, here's the next question also related to the uh, labral tear. Um, by the way, my audience is very, very intelligent. <laughs> the questions that they ask is so beyond. I learned from their questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the question is this, is the pain in the groin region due to a labral tear an example of radiating pain um, remote from the pain generator? And if the pain is associated with a labral tear uh, and it's due to radiating pain, then does palpating over the groin not recreate that pain or uh, palpate over certain areas to recreate okay. the pain? Okay, if I understand the patient, the question correctly. Yeah. Uh, as you know, that the hip joint, it's pretty deep. Yes. In the groin, it's, it's the last structure, you know, there's a lot of uh, other structure on top of the hip joint. And I agree, in people who are thin and athletic, you can palpate the groin area and, and push hard enough to induce pain if there is a labral tear. But mm -hmm. diagnosis of labral tear is essentially made by you bend your hip, you move your knee toward the midline and the foot toward the outside. Yeah. And if it, this causes the pain, it's very likely a labral tear. Yeah, I told them they should go to the, uh, you wrote the most amazing chapter in our book, yeah. uh, The Sages no, Pain this, Groin Pain. This, this is was, a pretty reliable sign, uh, Sharon. Yeah. Yes, very much. And the other thing also, as part of their, that where their pain is, labral tears also give buttock pain, whereas you don't get that with hernia pain. Yeah. The, right? uh, Label tear can give you what people call a C sign. They're gonna take their hand and yeah, and they're gonna put, let's say the thumb in the front and then they're gonna tell you that they have pain also in the bottom. Yes. Um, what is the pain associated with trochanteric bursitis or hip bursitis? How is that different? The, the, the pain associated with trochanteric bursitis, it's completely on the side. It's completely mm -hmm. lateral. Uh, usually, 
if you palpate, you know, the, the most prominent part of your of your hip, if I can yes. use that word, you're gonna trigger a very, very exquisite pain. Another thing that people needs to remember with a trochanteric bursitis, if you're standing without moving, it doesn't hurt. If you take really, really short step, it doesn't hurt. If mm. you start walking faster, longer step, you bend your hip more, it hurts. Yeah. Ultimately, stairs are very difficult. Getting up from a chair is very difficult. Yeah. I'm curious about your, uh, what you know about implant illness. As you know, there's something called breast implant illness. Uh, I'm starting to see more and more people with what we're now calling mesh implant illness. So they have a systemic reaction to the mesh implant. Their, their groin or belly or wherever the mesh is, is fine, but they start getting you know, hair loss and weird rashes and joint pains and swelling and chronic uh, fatigue and brain fog, memory problems. Um, um, no, weird tingling sensations in their hands and feet. And uh, you take out, uh, you take out the mesh and, and all of that goes away. So do you see implant illness or a systemic reaction yeah, to yeah, any yeah. orthopedic implants? Yes. Oh, I think really? the most uh, notorious uh, example is what they called, I would say about 10 years ago, uh, there are a few implants that came on the market. They were metal on metal. Yes. You know, there was a metal cup and a metal head without ceramic or polyethylene in between. Mm -hmm. And that metal usually is chrome cobalt. And these patients uh, would see elevation of their chromium level, cobalt level, nickel level. And that can give you some local problems, you, you know, with pain, inflammation, there is cause, there's something called a, a pseudo, pseudo tumor. It's not really a tumor, but it's a, a lymphocytic reaction to the mm -hmm. metal ions that are liberated. And also that can give you uh, kidney problems, uh, yes. and neurological problem. Fortunately, you don't see that with titanium implant, hasn't been ever been described with titanium implant. Mm -hmm. really with chrome cobalt implant. And these implants, they also contain nickel. A lot yeah. of people have nickel allergy. If you're allergic to uh, silver jewelry, you're probably allergic to nickel at the same time because there's a little bit of nickel in the silver jewelry. Yeah, if you wear cheap uh, earrings, which I do. Yeah. Oh, oh, or sometimes just the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the nickel the nickel in them i have a nickel allergy actually okay <laughs> so um yeah I, and so I, we I also think, see it in people that have like gallbladder surgery and they get clips yeah. and depending on the manufacturer of the vascular clip uh there may be nickel in it and i've had to take remove it in some patients it's a pretty amazing reaction they get although now i think most of these clips must be titanium yes yeah. they are um in males, I think what you need to look at, you know, if you have a, um, a watch in, you know, the back of the, the face of the watch is stainless steel, there's always a little bit of stainless, of a nickel in stainless steel, mm. and, and the, the person will have a rash or a, it, it's going to hitch under their watch and they stop wearing their watch, essentially. Yes, yes. Unless you have something really fancy at hundred thousand dollars <laughs> no it gets it, it falls into the surgical field so it's not worth that <laughs> you know, something that. like uh, patek philippe or something like that <laughs> yes that's correct <laughs> um what is psoas impingement syndrome and how does that present okay so if you talk about the hip people call talk about snapping hip so there are two types of snapping hips. The most common one is what people call the external snapping hips. It's essentially the, uh, the IT band, you know, rubbing over the greater trochanter, and it's gonna cause a trochanteric bursitis. And some patients, especially a young women that are very flexible, they can snap their hip for you. More unusual, is the internal snapping, which is essentially mm. a psoas impingement syndrome. Yeah. And 
So when you you bend your hip, first let's explain that the psoas tendon essentially is coming from the iliacus and the psoas muscle. Uh, the muscle mass is inside of the pelvis. They, they have a common tendon that comes out of the pelvis and go and attaches on the, the top of the femur and allows you to bend your hip. You know, it's the, the primary flexor or bender of the hip. Mm -hmm. So when the, the psoas tendon comes out of the pelvis to attach on the femur, it can get caught in, uh, you know, piece of bone if you've had a pelvic fracture in the past and hasn't yeah. healed perfectly. But these days, the number one cause of psoas impingement syndrome is someone who's had a hip replacement, the yes. cup was not perfectly positioned and the, like a ledge. the cup is sticking out. Yeah. So the psoas tendon rubs on, on the metal of the cup and it's very painful. Yeah. And then uh, staying on the topic of psoas muscle, what is psoas lengthening surgery? Because I have some people that come in that I was told I need psoas lengthening or they had groin pain and they've had psoas lengthening, usually at some like major institution that does a lot of these like fancy operations and like, but it never got rid of my groin pain. Of course, it wasn't related to that. So what is psoas lengthening surgery? Psoas lengthening, it's like any other tendon length lengthening. Um, you cut, cut the patient, the, the tendon in half, you go down and you cut the other half and you, uh, you reattach the tendon in a, in a longer position. So that the length of the tendon increases. But the psoas impingement syndrome can be a difficult diagnosis and it definitely okay. needs to be proven before thinking about any kind of surgery. And the way to prove it is to ask the radiologist to do a, an injection of the psoas tendon sheet with yes. xylocaine or marcaine. If the pain goes away for a few hours, then you prove the diagnosis, then you can go for a, a psoas tendon lengthening. Mm -hmm. um, the, in my experience, the failure of a psoas tendon lengthening procedures are essentially failure of diagnosis. The, the problem yes. was not the psoas impingement syndrome. That's what I've noticed. And I don't even see that many of those, those but every, every single one that's come to me, that was not their problem. And yeah. they had a very complicated like orthopedic operation. Yeah, and that, that's why I think it's important to establish the diagnosis without any doubt, and then you can proceed. Yeah, and th we have great radiologists at Cedar sinai yes. Thanks to you, I've made great um, friends with them. <laughs> uh, they're on my speed dial too. <laughs> um, but they're yeah. so helpful because I just feel, you know, uh, I'm very grateful that we have radiologists that you can speak to and actually like have a very uh, close relationship with and you can coordinate care for a specific patient. Oftentimes it's a very kind of distant relationship. You write an order in a computer and it spits out the other side and the radiologist may or may not do exactly what was necessary for the patient. Um, but to have radiologists that are actual clinicians that are interested in, in the patient's care is really, really cool. I'm gonna tell you something that um, we have four uh, musculoskeletal radiologists that see yes. theirs. Yeah. And believe it or not, I had never seen that before. Sometimes they go and they examine the patient before doing the MRI or the procedure and all that. Yeah. They are really, uh, they're not, they are really physicians. They are not like uh, x-ray readers. Oh, I have, absolutely. I have the greatest respect for them. I had one lady, I said, you know what? I think she has a general femoral nerve injury from mm -hmm. her lateral spine approach. Um, and I said, the only way I can prove that is, uh, I can't, uh, so I can't have pain inject her back. Her back is a mess. Like she's got so much hardware there and I can't inject in the front because that's not where her injury is. It's yeah. in the psoas where the general femoral nerve is coming out. Yeah. And I basically work with them. We figured out exactly on imaging where this general femoral nerve would be within the psoas muscle, where it's coming out. Um, <laughs> and 
he via imaging guidance literally went exactly there and the lady is cured and you know for a radiologist to cure a patient it's not common yeah um but he he examined the patient and yeah. like like did everything before and then followed through afterwards and it was like the most satisfying thing that he was able to kind of understand like my thought process but make it happen because i can't do it um and cured the lady yeah uh, i'm gonna say something very controversial i think most radiologists are overpaid for what they do <laughs> but our four musculoskeletal radiologists at cedars are underpaid for what they do Yes, I would say I would say that's very true. I'm very grateful. I learned MRIs by sitting next to Rolla and just yeah. having her read my images and I would ask questions because we don't learn. I mean, you in your specialty, MRI is very important. In yeah. general surgery, it's not. It's CT scans and x-rays. So uh, MRI is very foreign to us. So I had to learn it. And she was very, very, she's so good at it. And she, I was like, I don't even call her anymore. I read all my own imaging because I was able to learn from her. So I agree a lot of the radiologists are overpaid because uh, I read my own image. I don't even read the <laughs> report. <laughs> I don't even need the report. <laughs> Just read it myself. It's usually incorrect anyway. <laughs> yeah. We oh, actually oh, published two papers on that about how incorrect it is. It's like too three vain. out of four, three out of four <laughs> incorrect. Can you believe that? Yeah. Yeah, horrible. Horrible. Well, um, you've had a long day. I really appreciate the time My pleasure. with us, but I won't let you go too far. I know where you live and I know how to reach you. Okay. So <laughs> actually I don't know where you live. Um, <laughs> but I know where you live during the day. Okay. So I will make sure that uh, in 2022, we bring you back and okay. ask more questions. Cause we and, have uh, I'm, I'm going to be on today. time. Next time. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate any time you give us. And thanks, okay. everyone. Thanks for joining us on Hernia Talk Live. I'm signing out, Dr. Tofai. Thank you to Dr. Guy Paymal. We will bring him back, I promise, uh, next year. Um, we're pretty much booked this year. and We've got some other great specialists to talk with as well. Thanks to everyone who submitted your questions ahead of time, everyone who was here live. And I'll make sure that you have access to this session on YouTube so you can like and share with others. And I will see you all next week. Thank you, Keith. Bye. Bye-bye.